Now, this is absolutely unheard of. This kind of reduction is just mind-blowing. So 73% smaller glucose spike for the exact same meal. Pretty impressive, no doubt. We'll see if the science stacks up. But for now, let's get an introduction. Hello, angels, and welcome to the Glucose Goddess Show. I'm Jessie Introspe. I'm a biochemist, and I'm obsessed with helping you feel better. I want you to understand your body in and out so that you can reclaim your health and live the life that you want to live. So today, we are going to be discussing a very, very simple hack that doesn't cost you anything, isn't restrictive, isn't difficult. You can start doing it today and it can completely transform your health. Okay, seems like a pretty ideal scenario, I'd say. But why do we care about glucose spikes? Again, let's hear her out and then we'll crack open some studies physionic style and see the data for ourselves as well as contextualize this work. And I'll give you some contextualized takeaways later as well. First, the glucose goddess, Jessie. I just wanna remind you that most of us, whether or not we have diabetes, most of us are experiencing glucose spikes on a daily basis. And a glucose spike is simply when your blood sugar concentration increases really quickly after you eat a meal. Now, small spikes are totally normal and nothing to fear, but most of us actually have pretty big spikes on a daily basis. And these spikes lead to cravings, fatigue, needing a lot of coffee to get through the day, skin issues, hormonal issues, sleep issues, feeling sluggish, having brain fog, and then long-term glucose spikes lead to the development of diseases like type 2 diabetes. Well, the way that's laid out, I wouldn't want glucose spikes either. So next, Jesse mentions a study that goes into the magical tip that we can lower our blood sugar spikes dramatically, claimed to be 75%. So let's listen to the details. So the study was called Food order has a significant impact on postprandial glucose and insulin levels. And the main author was Alpana Shulka, and it was published in Diabetes Care. So in this study, what they did is that they took people who had type 2 diabetes, and they put these people into two groups. Both groups would eat the exact same meal, okay, for the whole time of the study. The same calories, the same composition, it was the same meal. But one of the groups was instructed to eat the ingredients, the elements of that meal in a specific order, okay? And both groups had their glucose levels continuously monitored to see the impact. She's talking about uh, this study, and I'll go ahead and mention that she got one detail incorrect in the study design. It wasn't uh, two groups of people, but one group of people who underwent an experiment twice. This is known as a crossover design. It may not matter to you, but for those in the medical background, uh, you'll know that there are some differences. Either way, it doesn't impact the results too much. And Jesse's right that the participants were instructed to consume the same meal in order, and then the researchers continuously measured their blood sugar levels and insulin levels over time after the meal. Then they repeated the experiment, but consumed the meal in a different order. Cool, but what happened? One of the groups ate first the vegetables, so they started with the tomato salad and the broccoli, then the chicken, and then the bread and orange juice, while the other group just ate things however they wanted. Gotta jump in here again. Uh, this isn't entirely correct. And this time it really does matter because this part is the whole point of the study. It's true that the participants ate carbohydrates last, as Jesse pointed out, but the second time they did it, uh, they specifically reversed the order of the foods, meaning that they consumed the carbohydrates first, then the rest. This is important because it's this second condition that gives us the illuminating clue on how to eat food that Jesse will get into. So they didn't eat the food as they wanted, they specifically ate it in reverse order. What they found was absolutely revolutionary. They found that in the group that ate their meal in that specific order, the glucose spike of the meal was reduced by 73%. 73% less impact from that meal 
on the participants' glucose levels. Now, this is absolutely unheard of. The results. 73% reduction in blood sugar in those that consume the carbohydrates last, to be clear. That's why making sure that we're clear on the groups and the study design is imperative. Let's look at that data. Here we go. We see the two conditions. Remember, the same people just eating the same meal in a different order. And all that we have to focus on is if they consume their carbohydrates first or last. Then we have the blood glucose levels over 120 minutes of continuous measurement. If the numbers are higher, then there's more blood sugar. Clearly, at any time, consuming carbohydrates leads to a greater blood sugar spike. This is pretty fascinating because simply changing your food order can lead to such a dramatic effect. Now, where did that 73% reduction come from? It comes from another measure called an area under the curve here. Now, let's contextualize this a bit because while we heard glucose spikes are bad, I can just as easily say that touching grass gives you cancer, but just because I said it doesn't mean that it's actually true, unless maybe you smoke it. So is there any evidence? If we pop open a scientific study on the matter, the researchers are looking at the effect that glucose blood sugar has on cardiovascular disease. Therein, they mentioned that having elevated blood sugar is likely a risk for cardiovascular disease. They go into the mechanisms like endothelial dysfunction, the rage pathway, and a bunch of complexity that I'd be happy to address for you in the future. It might help if you subscribe though, just an FYI. Otherwise you'll miss it and that would be, well, sad for both of us considering I like being able to talk to your face. Anyway, the researchers also mentioned that there is some evidence that glucose spikes specifically may have a heart disease promoting role, which is not captured by long-term measures like HbA1c. Those researchers aren't the only ones. For example, these researchers indicate that there are a few studies that show blunting post-meal blood glucose sugar spikes can help reduce the risk of diabetes. It's an area that I need to investigate further because some of the studies that they cite are drugs that specifically blunt the glucose response. And I need to look into off-target effects that might confound these results. Either way, there's some evidence in favor of the notion that egregious glucose spikes are unwanted. Still, I also think that there's a good amount of uncertainty on exactly how impactful that is. So look out for future content by me on the topic. That all said, there's four takeaways from this video. One, while glucose spikes are still being investigated on their role in diabetes, and we also don't know the exact magnitude of the effect, we do know that chronically elevated blood sugar levels and insulin insulin levels are an indication of poor health. In that vein, I would worry less about glucose spikes and likely worry more about the chronically elevated blood sugar and insulin levels, and then maybe turn my attention onto the glucose spikes. I would even guess that resolving the chronic issues would likely improve the glucose reactivity experienced from meals. Two, the study that Jesse cites is really interesting, but it doesn't speak to any outcomes. And additionally, it has a notable limitation in that the experiment ended after 100 120 minutes of measurement. When we look at the overall glucose burden within 120 minutes, the condition consuming carbohydrates first will have much higher glucose levels. But it's also telling to extend the experiment for several more hours to compare the total glucose burden since the condition consuming carbohydrates last probably wasn't done absorbing all the carbohydrates by the end of the experimental time. Oh, and the researchers repeated this study in people without diabetes pre-diabetics to be specific, and found similar results. But exactly as I mentioned, when they extended the time of the measurement for the blood glucose, it was lower later in the trial. What meaning this has in terms of diabetes progression is not detailed here, however. Three, Jesse did not mention this as far as I could tell, but when we've been talking about consuming carbohydrates first or last, we're not talking about consuming carbohydrates, then immediately eating protein, etc. We're talking about consuming carbohydrates, then waiting 15 minutes, and then consuming the rest of the food. So if glucose spikes are a worry for you, here is the correct protocol. If you have carbohydrates, then eat them 15 minutes 
after consuming the rest of your meal. Four, the uptake of carbohydrates in the intestines is heavily dependent on the other nutrients that you consume with. So consuming fish filled with omega-3 and protein can drastically reduce the glucose spike as just I mean, one example of thousands. So while this study told us something about how we eat and clearly showed dramatic effects, it's not like most people consume their foods in such a timed way. And that mixture of food really affects the results that we'd see here. Still, it doesn't mean that we can't actionably create some time between eating non-carbohydrate foods and carbohydrate foods to experience the significantly reduced glucose spike. That's a pretty cool phenomenon. And it clearly is easy and free to Jesse's earlier point. Oh, and if you want to test this on yourself, the usual cutoff for getting too high in blood sugar spike is around 180 milligrams per deciliter or 10 millimole per liter after eating. Anyway, if you like this kind of uh, scientific deep dive, then check out this next video right here and I'll speak with you over there. Bye.